Thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like to start with sharing one of my biggest frustrations with you. But before I do that, I would like to ask you two questions, and for that I would like to see some hands. So, who of you does regular code reviews? Good. So, who of you has pointed out some common code style issues or some bugs during these code reviews? Well, that's good, because that is directly related to my frustration. When I uh, am reviewing a pull request, it's not really a problem when I have to write a comment because I see some code style issues or, or some bugs. But it starts to get slightly annoying when it's the fourth time that week that I have to point out this bug. Because I start to wonder, hey, why do I, do, do I need to do this manually? Why can't we simply automate this? Well, my name is Rick Ossendrijver, and today I'm going to show you a solution to this problem. And we're going to automate these things with, with a tool called Error Prone. So, um, I'm a software engineer at uh, Picnic, and Picnic is an online supermarket based in the Netherlands. And we are a very tech-focused uh, company with a strong engineering culture. And today we're going to focus on one of the tools that we use, and that is Error Prone. First, uh, a little uh, agenda. First, I will tell a bit more about the code quality uh, processes that we have and how we try to prevent a lot of repetitive discussions from happening. Then I will introduce to you Error Prone, after that, I will show how you can start introducing error prone in your company or within your team, because uh, actually starting to use it can be a bit difficult. Uh, then I will show you how we use error prone within Picnic. I will share some lessons that we learned while introducing it within our company. And uh, last but not least, I will show you how we uh, started applying many of the rules within Picnic. So. One of the things that we really try to prevent is having, trivial, uh, having a long discussions about trivial issues. And there's a, a, word, a name for that, and that's the bike shed effect. Uh, in the example, you see that uh, well, we're, they're building a, a nuclear power plant, and there are not many experts on a nuclear plant. So uh, it costs a lot of money to build it, but because there are not many experts, not a lot of discussion is going on there. But on a bike shed, many people can have an opinion and as a result, a lot of discussions are happening while it costs only a little money compared to the nuclear plant. Well, what does this have to do with code? Let me show you an example. Because what if your, a colleague of you does a review of one of your pull requests and he points out, hey, uh, you're using, well, let me rephrase that. There are two ways of writing one and the same thing. You see here the string uh, dot is empty or the dot equals with an empty string. Both things do exactly the same thing, but this is like a code style uh, issue. But you see that someone pointed out, hey, we agr agreed on using method A instead of using method B. And there are some upvotes on this issue. So you can, as a result, a whole discussion can be triggered about which one is best. Do we use is empty or equals with empty, empty string? It doesn't really matter, code style issue. So it's okay to have this discussion once, but you need to make sure that you have it uh, with the whole company that you agree on one or the other and as a result of that uh, discussion make sure that you enforce this over your whole code base so you don't get these stupid comments about these trivial things and make sure that they are actually automated for you such that you don't need to worry about these things again of course this is a fairly simple issue but you can imagine that uh, if you have many of these rules about these simple things or some uh, subtle bugs if you can automate that, you don't need to worry about those things again. And as a result of, if instead of having to look at some code style things, you can focus on the things that are way more important during a code review. For example, does the, uh, the new code actually support all the requirements and is it actually correct code? Those things are way more important during code review. Let me give you a few other quick examples of some of the comments that we would like to automate and things that you can actually see during the code review. One example is, hey, please use immutable list uh, instead of collection.empty list. Another one is, hey, test methods should not be public, or you forgot, a, a final, you forgot to add the final keyword somewhere. As you can see, some simple examples, why can't we simply automate that such we don't need to write a comment about these things? Well, within Picnic, we use quite a few different tools that try to minimize these kind of discussions uh, within the company. And I will take you through a few of them. 
the first one and the easiest one is using a formatter. Internally, we use a fairly strict formatter, namely the Google Java format. And as a result of this, it will automatically reformat all our code. And there are no discussions possible with your teammates about where to put the curly bracket, either on the same line of a class definition or on the, on the next line. And I can tell you that already saved years of discussions between developers within our company. Another type of tools is the static analysis tools. So for example, SonarCloud, CheckStyle, and SpotBugs, they are nice tools that can find uh, problems in your code. They will point them out. They will have some nice dashboards. But there's one downside to these, these tools, and that is that they don't fix it for you automatically. So you will know uh, that you have to fix a lot of things, but still you need to check out the code, apply the changes, and you have to push the changes. Well, that's why we wanted to take it one step further, and we went looking into more uh, different kind of tools. And that's when we ended up with error prone. So what is error prone? Error prone is a static analysis tool for Java, but it can not only find and detect these bugs in your code, it can also automatically fix these things for you, such that you don't need to do it manually. How does that work? Well, let's say you have a class, and uh, you're starting to compile that, and uh, so the compiler starts to compile it, uh, gather a lot of extra information about uh, your class, uh, is it valid, does some extra type checking. So a lot of extra context is, is made available by the compiler. And when the compilation is done, error prone kicks in and can use this additional uh, context to do a much more thorough analysis of your code, while still having a link to the actual source code, which means that it finds a bug, but it knows how you write your code, how, you, uh, how, how your exact code looks like, and then it can say, hey, you can fix this code by applying these changes. And then even cooler, if you run error in patch mode, it will even automatically fix it for you. So let's say you have a large code base and uh, you enable one specific bug pattern, you run it on your code base, it will find all the different violations in all files, and then if you run it then in patch mode, all these particular changes, all these violations will be patched for you. So that uh, makes error prone a really powerful tool. Especially if you know that uh, Google opens, uh, uh, has about uh, 500 plus error prone checks that uh, you can use. There are different kind of severities. You have error warnings, uh, suggestions, but you can all tweak them and you can sometimes disable them if they are not applicable on your code base, for example. So there is one downside to, uh, to error prone checks, and that is that writing a check yourself can be quite complicated. For those of you, for those of you who still remember from uh, computer science, if you have to work with an abstract syntax tree, it can get uh, complex relatively quickly. So, and that's what you have to do when you implement one of your own checks. But the people at Google thought about this, and they wanted to make it very easy for everyone to specify simple refactorings. So what they did is they built another tool on top of error prone, and that tool is called Refaster. So with Refaster, you can specify these refactorings using before and after templates, and in the before template, you specify, hey, I want to go over the code, I want to match things that look like this, and if you find one of them, I want to refactor it to the thing you provide in the after template. Let me show you an example that makes it a bit clearer. So you see here a refaster uh, rule, where we have uh, in the top a before template, and below we have uh, an after template. And let me get my laser pointer to show you something. So what this means is that when we are going to analyze the code, we want to match, we want to go over all the expressions in the code base that are of type string. And then uh, what Refaster does, it puts it in here. So for example, let's say we have an arbitrary if statement with uh, a string field. It means that that string field, string field will be put in here. And then we are checking if uh, dot equals empty string is used here. Well, that is the case. So it means we have a match. And then when we run this rule, it will rewrite it to, to the content given in the after template. And that is the dot is empty operator. So as you can see, this is a really easy way of specifying these simple refactorings. And of course, again, this is a simple example, but you can do many of these things. And we will so see some more examples as well. There is one uh, slight downside to uh, refaster. And that is that these refaster rules will only run on expressions and statements. 
So that means you can only uh, refactor things inside method bodies, basically. But uh, yeah, now that you know what error prone is, I will show you a demo. But before I do that, I want to explain you two Maven profiles because throughout this presentation we will uh, see them a bit uh, more often. So uh, during the demos, I will use Maven, but please note that error prone also works for other build tools like Gradle and uh, Bazel and more. So what we're, what we're going to see is that we're, we have a Maven build and we're going to put two profiles on top of that. So first we have the Maven build and then we say that there is an error prone profile which adds some configuration to just run error prone and do the analysis. Then uh, the, next, the next profile we will see in a second. Let me first show you the example of the profile. So uh, this is the error prone profile where we are going to extend the, uh, the, compi the Maven compiler plugin and add some configuration that we see here. And what we basically say is that we want to add some compiler arguments and with the minus x plugin error prone, we enable error prone. And after that, we can configure error prone just how we want it to be. Uh, in this case, well, uh, we don't target JDK 8, so we want to say, hey, please uh, disable uh, the Java 8 API checker. Just a simple example, but here you can do many different things. So this enables error prone, but then we also need to have the patching profile to make sure that we actually apply it in, in the source files. So we can specify uh, here which checks we want to run from error prone. Uh, I would say the default is the, the empty string for us. So it will mean that all the checks will be applied on our code base. And what is really important here is the patch location. And here we say that we want to patch in place, which then means in the actual source file. Another option would be that we only uh, show the suggestions. And yet another uh, example would be that we provide a, a, a patch file like that you can apply with, with Git, uh, so it will store the changes there. So now uh, let's move to the demo. Yes. So there is this uh, very simple clause, and I'm going to ask you a few questions about this. And, uh, well, there's a little uh, quiz involved. So, well, we are an online supermarket. We have our own assortment. You can win a small prize. There's some nice chocolate here. Uh, so please uh, watch, watch this. There are three methods. And in all of these methods, there is something that can actually be improved, or which is not ideal, or maybe even a subtle bug. And I'm going to ask you, do you spot anything? Can you spot anything in any of these methods that is not good? One in the back. I, well, for the first one was string dot length equals zero. I didn't get what was. <laughs> okay, the um, it's an expensive call is what is being said in the in the back. That's the short version. Okay, uh, another one was, I heard there something. Was you don't throw the new illegal argument exception. Also, a good one. We will see in a second because uh, error prone will do it, run its analysis and then uh, we see if you're right or wrong. I uh, want one more. Yes? If the string is no, it can give a no point exception. Also a good one. In the, center, in the middle method, any? Two immutable sets. Indeed, we're doing a copy off operation while well, we don't need to do that. Good one. Uh, the people that had a, a good answer, please, after the uh, talk, come to me, and then we will uh, handle the, uh, the chocolate. So I asked uh, error prone to take a look. We did Maven clean install, and then minus P error prone to enable the, patch, uh, the error prone profile, and then hence run the uh, error prone analysis. And uh, what we're going to see is that there are a few things that are uh, found by error prone. One of them is a refast rule that found a refactoring opportunity. Uh, did you mean restring, uh, return string dot is empty? Well, this is something we prefer. Uh, so yes, this is a good one. Another one is a dead exception. Indeed, uh, correct. Uh, exception created, but not thrown on uh, this line. Well, indeed, we, me we meant the uh, throw new illegal argument exception. Another one is on line 17. Let me scroll a bit. Is 
identity conversion, this method invocation appears redundant. Uh, did you mean return set? Well, yes, indeed, we meant that. Um, but now, uh, usually, you would have to apply these changes manually, and that's, of course, something we don't want to do. So we are going to leverage the patch profile, which we will put on top, and then we will see what error-prone will do if I click here in a second. So if I now click here. Indeed, we see a few changes. We see, indeed, that the throw new illegal argument exception is there. Uh, we are not uh, doing a copy off anymore, and below here we have a string dot is empty. So that is quite nice uh, because it fixes it for us. Then um, you might ask, what if I have a very simple, a specific edge case where I want to have, well, let's say we want to have this string dot length equals zero for a specific reason. Then what we can do oh, is suppress warnings empty and we can say please error prone do not consider this case uh, because we want it for some reason now i'm going to run it again but uh, for the attentive viewer uh, what you might uh, see is that we are doing uh, we have a set here and well uh, intellij also already says this uh, we can inline the variable here and uh, we can also write this a bit shorter i think so let's see what will happen on a subsequent run of error prone it takes a second and then, indeed, if, well, I didn't need to click even, what we see is that we are now uh, returning uh, directly here, and we have a check argument. And then, it, more importantly, this one uh, is not changed because we added the suppressed warnings. So as you can see, it can qu fight, find quite some nice things, and w if you run error multiple times, it will even find more refactorings because uh, first, you apply some things, then it needs to uh, compile it again to have all the information, and then it can see, hey, I found some more refactorings, so you can run it till there are no further changes. Okay. Now, on to some examples. There is a documentation website of Google itself where you can find information on all the different uh, 500 dif different bug patterns. Um, and see how you can suppress them and uh, yeah, why there are good checks. But I will also highlight some examples to give you an idea of all the things that you can uh, do with error prone. A uh, simple one is the self comparison. It will detect, hey, you are comparing an object with itself. Another one is if you are overriding equals but not hash code, uh, you should make sure to do it. Also an easy one uh, to forget. Uh, and there are also quite some checks that will help you with uh, using daytime uh, date uh, in a correct way uh, because yeah, it can detect if you're probably making like a really weird date. Another, another one is, is the following. Um, since uh, Java 8, well, let me rephrase. What you can see here is that there are many of these final keywords in places where since Java 8, it's not really possible, any, not really necessary anymore, because it can detect, hey, this is effect effectively final. Uh, we don't need it. But you want it to be strict on uh, your code um, code style, so you have this strong engineer, you have this agreement within the team that if you can add a final keyword, you make sure to do it, and as a result, it looks quite cluttered. But what if, uh, be because it's not really necessary anymore, it would be nice if we can change this agreement within the team of adding it everywhere to make sure that we, where it's not needed, we don't add the final keyword anymore. Because now, if you look at the code, the default is, hey, a local variable is mutable unless we add the final keyword. But what if we change this around with one of the bug patterns of error prone? It's called the var, var bug pattern. What if we change our default assumption about the code and say, hey, we make the agreement that a local variable is immutable, and we don't need to uh, add a final keyword for that. But if we have a mutable variable, then we add an annotation called the advar annotation. And error prone will help you with uh, applying these changes. And as a result, it will enforce that if you, are, if you have a local variable that you are changing, it will say, hey, please add the advar annotation because you are changing this local variable. What I want to show here is that, that error prone can help you with enforcing these team uh, or company-wide agreements and make sure uh, yeah, it is consistent throughout your code base. 
Another one that, uh, that helped us uh, immensely is uh, this simple refaster rule that rewrites optional.get.2. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase. Which rewrites optional.get to optional.orelse throw. Because, well, optional.get got introduced, many people started using this, but then the or else throw got introduced, and it says, hey, please use the or else throw. But uh, when I was reviewing code, I saw people not rewrite, they were touching some of the, uh, the code, they didn't rewrite to the dot or else throw, and I was writing comments, hey, please uh, use the new thing that we should use, uh, migrate it, migrate it, and this was a repetitive process, but we could solve this by writing one simple refaster rule, um, well, as you can see, it's fairly uh, simple. Then we applied it on the whole code base and all the usages were rewritten. And no one was, uh, could introduce the old one anymore because refaster would automatically rewrite it for us. So that saves a lot of uh, comments that I had to write during the code review. So now you have seen uh, what error prone is. I want to show you how you can start using it in practice because this can be quite complicated. As I mentioned, there are over 500 bug patterns provided by error prone. But if you would, uh, if, and let's say you have a big legacy code base and you would simply start enabling error prone and use all the error checks. A lot of changes would be introduced in your code base. And if you would say, hey, uh, I ran error prone, many changes, all nice changes, fixes some bugs, some nice uh, things we, uh, that, that could be big bugs in the end. And then you open a pull request, well, there is no colleague who would want to review these thousand lines of code that are changed. So you need to be a bit mindful about this, and you need to make sure that you take this step by step. So I made a, a small uh, roadmap that can help you uh, with this. So the first thing you do is you, uh, you, get, you start with the code base, you introduce error prone with the two profiles that I mentioned, uh, but you disable all specific checks from error prone. What you can then do is you can pick, uh, you can go over the list of all the, the checks. You can find some checks that you think, hey, if I enable this specific check and my colleagues will see all these changes, they will, they will be like, hey, this is something uh, really nice. This is something that would be a big problem for us. So uh, nice that you fixed that for us. Then you open the pull request. You ask some people out, uh, from the team, can you re review this uh, small pull request? And because you enable one bug pattern, all the changes are really similar and easy to review. We will see that in a second. And then uh, once that PR is merged, uh, you have to repeat this process quite a few times to get everyone into the habit of reviewing these kind of PRs. Um, yeah, and once you have, the goal is, is very much to get people enthusiastic about the tool and make sure that they are really happy with the changes that you're introducing because they need to agree. Because if you are pushing many pull requests saying, hey, I want to do this, I want to do this, and they are like, no, I, I, I'm not really on board, I don't agree with these changes, they will basically push back or stop reviewing them. And you're there trying to get it in, but they don't want it. So you make, should make it a collaborative uh, thing. So then the question is, um, how does that look like if you enable one specific bug pattern? Well, I wanted to uh, show you this. So what I did, I went on uh, GitHub and I looked for a bit of an old project, uh, old open source, no, well, not, not relatively, not per se old, but I mean uh, a, an open source project that I could find some nice improvements for. Well, then I found uh, one from uh, Gravity, and well, this was a, a code base that could really use some error prone because there were quite some things that have to be fi had to be fixed. For example, there were over 500 uh, unused imports with. Uh, that you can simply uh, get rid of with a, a formatter. So first I did that, I cloned the repository. Uh, let me switch. Oh, it was already there. So what I did, I cloned this repository, I added the formatter, uh, and then I want to uh, show you how we go about enabling one bug pattern. So what you see here is that we have, I already have the command prepared, of course, where we have a Maven package with uh, the minus p error prone to enable the error prone profile, then the minus p patch to enable the patch profile, and then what I use is this error prone patch checks field, and that allows us to say, hey, I only want to run the unnecessary final bug pattern on this code base. 
So, uh, well, we can now press enter, and, but I'm going to cancel it because if we would have to wait till the end, it's quite a large code base if we would wait till, uh, till it finishes. It would take quite some minutes, so I already prepared uh, a cherry pick that I can do under this alias, I believe. Yes. So uh, now what we now see is that th it's the result of applying this specific check on the code base. And we see that almost 800 files are changed, and we have over 4,000 lines of code changed. So there were quite some unnecessary finals in this code base. And now we're going to hope that the Wi-Fi of my Wi-Fi works well. Because let's see the result of this. So I pushed this and I prepared the URL. Then I need to zoom in a bit, of course. Is it readable in the back? I see nodding faces, nice. So we indeed see the patch unnecessary final bug checker. And then uh, please take a look at these changes. And what you will see is that they are fairly easy to review. Because what our brain is doing, it sees, it can basically pattern match across the code and it can see, hey, it's, they're all so similar, these changes that you, that while there are quite some lines of code changed, it's relatively easy to, to do this. And this is then what you would ask colleagues to also do. And then, um, well, when, when they think, hey, I like these changes, we can indeed clean up this code quite a bit. Uh, then they can simply approve it and, um, and, and you can start repeating this process. To slow, to uh, reiterate, um, we start with disabling everything and make sure that with one simple um, command we can run this one bug pattern, and then at the, uh, we need to repeat this a lot. Until uh, we are at the point where we have all the error checks enabled, and that is a really nice first milestone uh, for you to, to get to. Now I want to uh, switch to some of the lessons that we learned from uh, applying it within Picnic and how we uh, set this up as well. So uh, at Picnic we have over 70 different repositories uh, and all these repositories have one common Maven parent. And in this Maven parent we have a lot of shared libraries, a lot of configuration that as a result of it being the parent is uh, apl applied on all the 70 different repositories. And what we have there, what we also provide in all the repositories is a simple patch script. And that patch script will make sure that you uh, do a Maven clean install and use the two Maven profiles to run all the bug patterns on all the different repositories. So the, the workflow would be that you as a developer, uh, you are writing some code and uh, well, before you open a pull request, the idea is that you run the patch script and make sure you have no violations with one of the bug patterns. Let's say uh, you forget to run this, then uh, our CI will of course do some extra checking because um, one more thing, how we configured it is that uh, we, ha we add two flags, uh, minus W error and all suggestions as warnings, which means that even the slightest violation, either a, a error, warning or suggestion will fail the build. So it's not possible to, have a to, to merge a pull request if there is a violation. Because what will happen is that it says, hey, I'm running a Maven clean install and there is a violation of one of the bug patterns, which means that you cannot merge it. You need to check it out, run the patch script, and then, it will, uh, and then you have to commit the changes yourself. You might wonder why uh, wouldn't you auto commit this? Well, it's really important that the developer stays in control of all the changes that you're uh, introducing such that we, yeah, you also always need to check if it's actually correct and if it's the thing you actually want to do. So at some point we were using all the error prone checks and we thought this is so nice, we want, but we want to do even more. We want to make our code base even more consistent, write more rules. So uh, we looked at Google and well, there is this issue that is still open from 2017. And um, yeah, someone asked, hey, probably you have a lot of refast rules uh, inside uh, internally at Google. Please, can you open source them? Because we're probably writing the same simple rules for uh, a lot of things. Well, I, I can tell you that on this, uh, this thread, every year there's someone who reminds uh, the author of this issue and says, hey, can you please, please, please open source the rules? But this, uh, to this date, this has not happened. But then we were thinking, okay, 
maybe we should start writing our own uh, collection of rules to apply on our code base. And that is what we did. So uh, about seven years ago, we started with this uh, repository called error prone support. And uh, yeah, after all these years, we have collected so many rules. We have now over 900 refast rules. We have 40 uh, bug checks. And the, the idea of all these, these um, rules is that we uh, want to uh, help with uh, deprecations, uh, simple migrations, uh, test and G assertions to assert J or uh, code style issues. We want to, uh, yeah, everything uh, goes basically. But it's really a picnic opinionated set that goes a lot further. And um, yeah, I want to show you a simple example because, well, why are we doing this? Let's say that, uh, well, in this example, there are basically three ways of writing one and the same thing. So you see uh, in the before template, we have a null equals object and an object dot is null. Um, and in the after template, we have the opposite object, object equals null. Well, basically three ways of writing the same thing. So with one refaster rule, we can say, hey, please match, all, uh, match the first two cases. And if you find them, rewrite them to the content of the after template. So we allow for only one uh, way of writing this in our code base, and we fix it automatically for you if you uh, write one of the uh, first two. Another uh, thing that we have is we, we try to help out with, uh, we, we try to guide with using APIs uh, internally. So for example, we have the SLF4J log statement bug pattern where we say, hey, where we identify that if you are right here, laser pointer, so if you, are, uh, ha if you have a statement with percent %s, we automatically rewrite that to the, the curly brackets for you, uh, because that's what you mean. And uh, note here that we have a, a format string with one uh, placeholder. And in the bottom here, we are, uh, we are using that incorrectly. In the first statement, we are not passing something in for the placeholder, but in the second one, we are. And we wrote a check that says, hey, uh, log statement contains one placeholder, but specifies zero matching arguments. It fills the build because this is a simple bug that you have to fix. And there are many of these things that we have. But besides the rules that we have, we also, um, have, some, uh, we also have some other modules that improve the use of error prone. And uh, one of them is uh, that it allows you to a lot, uh, to it makes the running of refaster rules on your code base a lot easier because the support from Google itself is, uh, is not that good. You can only run one rule on one file. Well, we made sure that you can run all the rules on all files. Uh, there's also a testing support um, such that you can be sure that all the 900 refast rules are actually rewriting this, the code that you want to rewrite. Um, we have improve, improved reporting for refaster. What we saw in the demo was something like this, where a refaster rule uh, printed this uh, suggestion this is something we also built a support for ourselves. And we have a documentation website that I will also quickly show you. Um, and uh, on this uh, homepage, you can find how to install error, error prone in your code base or how you can run uh, refaster with some extra information. So you can check that out. Uh, but we also have the documentation for many of the bug pattern, for all the bug patterns. And um, let me show you an example. We saw the direct return check, and that directly links, if it finds a violation in your code base, it directly links to this documentation. So in your terminal, you can click, and you will go uh, directly here. Uh, with some nice examples, explanation on why we are doing this. Is it readable in the back, actually? No? Better? OK, yes. Um, let me show you some uh, examples of how far we can go, how far we would like to go with um, consistent code and make sure to minimize the repetitive discussions. We have, for example, uh, a nice check for static import where we, are, where we define which things should definitely be statically imported and which should definitely not be statically imported um, to, uh, yeah, to make our code base more consistent. Here you can see uh, some examples. Uh, arguments dot arguments doesn't really add a lot, so we say please statically import this. Um, and there are th these are just some simple examples, but there are many of them. And I also want to show some of the refast rules because this is to uh, drive 
uh, to, to just show you how much we value consistency. Because here you can see 10 different ways of checking whether a collection is empty. Um, and what we say is please simply uh, write, use one way of checking. Use the dot is empty operator with e either exclamation mark uh, or not to make it really consistent. And you can imagine, this is only one read faster rule. If you have 900 of them, your code base gets really consistent. So at some point, uh, we, uh, so we started with this error prone support, but we didn't start directly uh, from the get-go with applying th this uh, repository on all picnic repositories. So at some point, we had quite a large uh, battery of uh, re faster rules, and we thought, OK, now we need to make sure that they are all uh, valid, that everyone agrees with them, make sure there are no bugs in there, and we need to apply them uh, on, on, on the code base. So we started with uh, a process of actually, um, I would say that we, uh, what we did is we started with checking out a specific repository, apply the refaster rules on this repository and ask the team, hey, please review this, try to see if there's anything that you don't like or if it introduces a bug. Uh, what do you, and we really try to get their opinion and their feedback on how they liked the refaster rules. Because again, if we would say, hey, we uh, ran all the refaster rules on your repository and this is now how you have to write your code. That would simply not work because uh, developers don't like to be told how to write their code. Uh, they also want to have a say in, how, in, in what rules are nice and which rules are not nice. So we had to approach this uh, in, in a very um, gradual, gradual manner. Um, so what we did is we actually created like over 70 pull requests uh, spread over the 50 repositories we had back then. Um, and that, that uh, led to quite a lot of changes. Here you see some uh, numbers on, uh, on the screen. And I, uh, I, had, I was the lucky person of applying all these, ref of all these changes automatically. Uh, so you can imagine how many uh, uh, changes this introduced uh, in my GitHub profile. Um, so I was quite happy about that. And um, still, you see some numbers of quite some big pull requests. For example, 2,000 lines of code changed. How is, you might wonder, hey, you said it should be review reviewable by the other team members. How did you go about that? Well. We basically split up the changes in many different commits. And the idea was that uh, we said, hey, please review per, per commit, such that it is a lot easier for you to review these changes. Um, so for example, we have the comparator refast rules, collection refast rules, and because, because we grouped these changes, for all the developers, it became nice to review these changes. And of course, because we opened so many pull requests in different teams, you always find some really passionate developers saying, hey, this is not correct, or we should do, you do this differently. I'm not agreeing with this change. And that's, of course, uh, a good thing. We try to uh, gather all the feedback. Sometimes we could explain why it was a good thing to do or why it would be uh, the better option performance-wise or whatever. Um, but sometimes you notice that in quite some repositories, the same feedback, uh, we, we receive the same type of feedback. Then we were saying, OK, uh, good points. Let's see what the company thinks of this. And uh, well, what we did is we created a simple uh, Slack poll. And we said, hey, we have a few different options here. In this case, it's about the local time. And we said there are three ways of writing one and the same thing. Do you prefer one over the other? Uh, or, or you say, no, please don't uh, automate anything uh, regarding this, because it's not a good improvement. And what you see with most of these situations is that there are some opinionated developers, um, and there's, but there's a really large group saying, hey, I don't really mind which one of the three options you pick as long as it is uh, after making a decision and forced across the code base such that I don't need to think about it again. And that's the whole point. So that's why uh, when, you, when we did these kind of uh, polls, you usually saw that there was a, a slight preference for one or the other, and we could simply proceed with uh, uh, applying the refaster rule. So um, after uh, opening all these pull requests, uh, what you could, uh, well, we um, introduced basically all the, the, the refaster rules and the checks, 
and they are now running uh, continuously on our all of our code bases. Um, but the main goal was, of course, to get all the other developers that are doing the code reviews and are uh, finding some of the things that they have to repeatedly point out. We have to had to get their ideas from the other developers and add those rules to, to uh, error-prone support to make sure we minimize the repetitive discussions. So we had to incentivize the developers to actually contribute their ideas. And for that, we used a really uh, powerful mechanism. We said, hey, if you make a contribution, you basically get a custom sticker for your contribution. It sounds a bit stupid, but it worked really well. Within, uh, well, uh, at some point we already had over 50 contributors and we have some regular contributors who come with their uh, great ideas. Uh, and as a result, all the developers, so all the, the 70 plus repositories get monthly uh, updates uh, via the parent and as a result they run a simp simple script and they get free changes every month. All nice code improvements. In terms of uh, external adoption, uh, we're also doing quite well. Uh, there are some open source repositories like uh, Checkstyle and uh, Modern uh, Open Rewrite that are using our refaster rules. So that's quite cool uh, to see. And to, uh, to really show you how easy it is to implement your own refaster rule, I'm going to try and do a, a small live demo uh, where I show you how easy it is. So let's switch to the code. And of course, I already prepared something for you. Let's see. So I mentioned uh, in the beginning, well, halfway, I mentioned that we have a testing framework um, to validate that we are doing the correct changes. Well, what are we going to do? Let me uh, look this up. Um, could be very oh. Yes. What you can see here is that uh, the string has a copy value of, but what that actually does, it calls a uh, new string. Uh, so in this specific example, uh, it's just a nice example I picked for this demo, is what we want to do is we want to rewrite that uh, to the new string to allow for only one uh, of the two options in our code base. Um, so that's what you see here. You see uh, we, have a refa we are going to write a refaster rule, but to validate the changes, we have an input file and an output file. In the input file, we rewrite the bad code that we want to match, and then the output file should describe the input plus the uh, applying of the refaster rule and then the result of that. And um, yeah, that's what you see here. And if I would run the test right now, it should uh, fail because we haven't introduced a refaster rule yet. And indeed, it fails. It says, hey, I did not find the, th the new thing that we want because we want to rewrite to new string we only can find the copy value of. Well, let me go to... Uh, it says, hey, rewrite the string copy value of uh, to the new string. So that's what we're uh, going to do. And we have to first start uh, with writing the before template with the code that we would like to match. Uh, uh, string before. And here we need to pass in the argument of the uh, copy value of, which is a, a, a car array. So it's called like that. And then uh, we have to write the string copy value off. And we have to put in <laughs> nice, a lunch reminder. Um, <laughs> and then we say, OK, please match this code. And in the after template, we have to write to what code we want to rewrite that. And that is, of course, the new string. New string. And now, if I did everything correctly, we would say we would sh should see that the uh, that it is now correct. That the test is green. I meant. And indeed, well, it took uh, about one minute to actually uh, write this refaster rule. 
as you can see, fairly easy to specify uh, these oper uh, refactoring operations. So um, in about two hours, uh, three, no, well, at uh, 15, uh, 20, we will, uh, we will host a workshop on, uh, yeah, refaster. Uh, so we are going to, we're going over, uh, yeah, how you can actually write your own refaster rules and you will get some hands-on experience with this. So if you're interested in trying it out yourself, please come to our uh, workshop at uh, 15, 20. So a small conclusion. Um, we, uh, in the beginning, we talked about the repetitive discussions that we wanted to prevent from happening. Well, I mentioned that we incentivize the developers to actually contribute their own ideas. And because they, as a result of that, they could really be a part of, uh, of, of introducing these automated changes, they were really happy because they felt that they, yeah, because they were a part of it, they really liked that we were introducing this instead of it feeling like we were just pushing some stuff that they had to accept. So um, yeah, make sure that they are really on board with the changes that you want to introduce. So, and if you are uh, in the team that manages these, these configurations and decides which uh, checks go in, um, which, which checks are being applied on the code base or the, uh, throughout the company, please make sure that you validate with all the developers that will, uh, will have to work with this that they uh, like the changes, that they think it's a good change. Uh, and please make sure to take small steps there and listen to the feedback. So uh, with that, I've come to my last slide. Uh, I have two QR codes. Uh, one at the top right is, is for the open source repository. Uh, we, of course, uh, heavily appreciate the GitHub star, so uh, feel free to, to scan it. And uh, at the bottom left, we have uh, Jan Kote, Kote's um, contact details. So if you're interested in uh, one of his, uh, the vacancies at uh, Picnic. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. <laughs> Are there uh, any questions? Oh, and by, uh, by the way, I have stickers uh, from Cody and uh, Picnic if you want. So please, after that, come to the front. But uh, are there any questions? Yes. Do you specify Java version uh, when writing the rules? Um, no, so AirProne has a, yeah, has a, has a, has a minimum version, um, but you can write them for uh, basically ja Java 11 plus. Yeah, yeah, so if, how, how do you support multiple uh, versions is the question. Yeah. Um, well, sometimes you need to consider that when a check runs on, uh, 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 like if there's a small change in how it, uh, the internals work, you have to uh, write the check in such a way that it can run on both uh, Java versions. So sometimes you need to take that into account when creating a check. Thank you. No problem. Any other questions?